today's episode, Harold gives a drive-by science lesson, Bill has a cold can of pop, and I turn a car into a bicycle. <laughs> Here's the man I call uncle, my uncle, husband to the woman I call aunt, and favorite and only brother to the man I call dad. Here he is, Fred Breeze! <laughs> to the show. Uh, how are you today, Harold? <laughs> Ever excellent, as always. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. You don't get sick, do you, Harold? You're more of a carrier. <laughs> I'm not just a carrier. I'm a laser transporter. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been having a bit of fun uh, this week up at the lodge. Uh, the guys uh, are looking at some of that uh, bungee jumping, you know, where they uh, tie a big jock strap on your ankle and heave you off a bridge, you know? <laughs> And then the blood all rushes to your head and you damn near kill yourself and makes you feel young again, apparently. You know, actually, that bungee jumping is not safe and it's been banned in a lot of areas. Cement areas, I think. <laughs> well, of course, you know, we can't afford the real official uh, bungee jumping gear or anything, but Junior Sinkman got the idea that if you climb to the top of a real springy tree, like, you know, a will or something, you know, and you say you tie your foot off to the top branch and you just die, it's got to be the same effect, really, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta be a pretty good idiot to do that. <laughs> well, thanks for volunteering, Harold. Uh, uh, but we got a whole lineup of guys ahead of you. In fact, uh, they're waiting for this rope, so maybe we should uh, get on with the show. Oh, yeah, okay, sure, excellent. <laughs> because we have a superiorly excellent show for you this evening. <laughs> pretty much the same as all the others, as far as I know. <laughs> There's no understanding of the television business. Obviously. I often look back as I get older at the fun we had with Murphy's Boulder. It was six feet across, must have weighed nine tons, round and smooth as a baby's bun. We leave messages on it and lean against it. It was like a friend who was solid and true. Then after dark, we roll it into the lake and watch boats smack into it really, really hard. <laughs> oh, that's good enough. This week on uh, Handyman Corner, we're going to show you something that you can do with that old wreck of a car that you may have sitting out on your front lawn, say, or perhaps wedged into the garden shed. Now, up here at the lodge, of course, uh, when a car gets too dangerous to drive, we just sell it to another member. <laughs> But what do you do when a car literally falls to pieces? Sell it as a kit car? <laughs> now, a lot of people would uh, see this big pile of crap and figure, well, this is no longer a viable means of transportation. But a lot of people are not me. <laughs> I look at this stuff. I say, with a little elbow grease and some imagination, I can build myself a free 10-speed bicycle. <laughs> Golly, if the motor hadn't seized up, I could build a moped. <laughs> All right, the first thing you need to make yourself a two-wheeled bicycle, of course, is two wheels. Uh, I got four to choose from, so I threw the two ugly ones away. And I got Harold's toothbrush and cleaned all the roadkill out of the treads of these. But, uh, you want to make sure that there's uh, no leaks in these things. So uh, what you do is you take the tire and just stick her down into a, into a bucket of water and watch for uh, the bubbles coming to the surface, sort of like uh, old man Sedgwick in Possum Lake. You just put that down there easy as pie. Oh, it's a little small for the <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we'll assume there. there's no leaks there. <laughs> now, I'm going to need to make a uh, frame for the bicycle. My golly, this will work right here. The exhaust system out of the unit. That should be right. That should be fine. Right. <laughs> oh, no 
wonder gas stations are so messy. <laughs> All right, uh, take a hacksaw, and you want to start uh, hacking this thing up, uh, you'll need uh, three two-foot lengths and two three-foot lengths. So that's three twos and two threes, uh, which is a full house, I believe. <laughs> Golly. Boy, uh, hacksaws are fragile things, aren't they? <laughs> All right, so uh, once you got your pipe cut, uh, you've you got enough pieces now to start building your frame. You know, you might just want to file those edges a little smoother, especially if you ride a bike in shorts. <laughs> now, to put all the pieces together, you can use stove bolts, or uh, you could use a welding torch, or you could use, that's right, the handyman's secret weapon, duct tape. <laughs> Got another roll there, Harold. And uh, there you have it. And if that isn't a real uh, head turner of a bicycle frame, I don't know what is. <laughs> now, this muffler is a dandy place to hold water for you long distance riders who can't hold your water. And uh, you're probably thinking to yourself, uh, what am I going to use for pedals? Ah, here we go, here we go. How about uh, window winders? <laughs> and then uh, for a chain, now, not much of it. Oh, here we go, here we are. We'll just uh, run a fan belt uh, from the pulley up to another pulley, and there we go there. And as far as uh, the gears go and whatever, ah, cars are full of gears. Gears everywhere in a car, that's not going to be a problem. You see, the secret is to make do with what you have. This is not just recycling, it's bicycling. <laughs> so uh, I'll get this all rigged together, but it's going to take a little while. Uh, why don't you go back to the show, and when I got her all done, I'll have you come back in here and I guess do a little show and off. <laughs> and now it's that part of the show where we expose the three little words that men find so hard to say, I don't know. <laughs> and here now is the expert, my Uncle Red, and of course, his good friend, Mr. Hap Shaughnessy, local fisherman and raconteur. <laughs> Alrighty. Dear experts, there's a guy at work that drives us all crazy. Whenever he tells you something, it's so full of lies and exaggerations that you can't believe any of it. What's with this guy? <laughs> well, Hap, this sounds like it's more in your area. <laughs> Well, it's a self-confidence problem, isn't it? And people uh, who stretch the truth, generally trying to make themselves more important than they really are, uh, just to make up for their poor self-image. That's very insightful. Yeah, that's what Sigmund Freud told me. <laughs> What's the very worst bragger and boaster that I ever met was on one of our climbs up Everest. We had seven attempts. All of them were successful, but you should have heard this guy and the stories that came out of his mouth. Space expedition, running the two-minute mile, playing billiards with the Pope. I happen to know the Pope only plays stripes and solids. <laughs> but this guy got to me so much, I had to leave the tent. I had to get out of there and sleep on the glacier. Better to risk another encounter with the abominable snowman than spend any more time with this man. Yeah, I know where you're coming from there, huh? <laughs> but of course, I didn't expect the avalanche. 350,000 tons of snow cleaved off that mountain and landed right on my knee. <laughs> the bad knee. <laughs> well, I wanted to scream, but uh, some of the crew were still sleeping, so I quietly just tried to dig myself out of bed. And after a few hours, I came upon this guy. This same guy, lying there, unconscious, his head stuck in an ice crevice, and I had a seven-pound pick with me, and I could have chipped him out. But I couldn't guarantee he'd still have ears. Right now, I would envy someone without ears. <laughs> yeah. So, I tried this little trick that I learned during the war from de Gaulle. <laughs> I, uh, I melted the guy out of there. You know, the pot of hot coffee and a turkey baster. And, uh, 
How about your self-confidence app? You think you have a poor self-image? Used to. Before I was knighted. No one asked him, Harold. It is spring. The bears emerge from hibernation, desperate for cohabitation. The birds fly home to mate and nest. The salmon return to spawn and rest. The deer come back to rut and roam. What I'm saying is, hi, honey, I'm home. <laughs> and uh, there you have it. She's uh, pretty well all rigged up. Looking pretty good, isn't it? I've uh, got the horn on here. I call that the Matterhorn, because it's a mountain bike. <laughs> and I uh, put uh, reflectors all over the back and so forth, so you can do some night riding. And I've got, uh, I've got the light on the front here. And remember the old-fashioned generators you used to have on your bike? Well, I just... Actually, that, one's a... that one is an alternator. <laughs> but uh, she's pretty well set to go. Got a little wind indicator right under the seat. Makes sense. And uh, let's just take her for a spin. Uh, OK, that muffler's still a little bit warm. Got to watch for that. Uh, I guess we'd mount her something. I'll just climb right up. Um. All right, well, I'm going to tighten a few things up. Maybe I need another couple of rolls of duct tape. Uh, but I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll take care of that. Maybe thin out the frame and uh, what have you and, uh, and uh, fix her all up. And I think she'll look quite a bit different by the time I do this properly. I'll just, I'll just make... Cut. And that's all it takes. Got a little extra time and effort, and I've made this into a, uh, a really a lovely 10-speed uh, bike that uh, coincidentally looks exactly like Harold's bike. That's how good, good of a job I've done. Eh? Right down to the name on it and even the dents. It's just amazing. I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> anyway, remember, the women don't find you handsome. They should at least find you handy. <laughs> Harold, we've traded bikes, by the way. Harold, Harold, Harold. <laughs> As it turns out, the uh, diameter of the tree and the springiness uh, didn't turn out to be nearly as important as, say, the strength of the rope. <laughs> whoa! Whoa! What happened to the rest of the rope? Well, uh, a lot of it is still tangled around the top of the tree, and the rest is kind of knotted around moose's nether regions. <laughs> boy, I'd, boy it's, that must have really hurt when moose hit the ground, because he's, you know, a big eater. Yeah, he's a big faller, too. Uh, he was doing a swan dive there, and I believe he'd be hitting about a Mach 4 when he struck Pater. <laughs> Luckily, he uh, landed on that pile of scrap iron and bricks we had left. Remember when the propane tank went up? Yeah, so that kind of broke his fall. But uh, he hit so hard that he actually cracked the Earth's crust. Is the planet going to be OK? Oh, yeah, it'll, it'll heal, Harold. But, you know, when we, when we all stopped laughing and so on, we went over to him and we rolled him over. And uh, there was like a, an underground cavern there. A, a grotto? Well, he was for a while. <laughs> but we looked closer, and it wasn't just a cavern. It was, it was an abandoned mine. A mine? Yeah. This is excellent. That's great. What, like, like a gold mine? A platinum mine. Platinum could be a diamond mine. Diamond mine, we'd be rich. We got, we got diamonds, we'd be rich. <laughs> it could be a diamond mine. This is exciting. Yeah, and I think it all started with something as harmless as tree diving. <laughs> Go figure. Oh, yeah, I can. <laughs> There's a secret to survival that all the woodsmen know. And I'm about to pass it on to you. Never run when you can walk. Never stand when you can lie, and never lie when a half-truth, or in fact, not answering at all, will do. Well, for uh, this week's Adventures with Bill, uh, he had invited me to come down and uh, have a little picnic out behind the lodge, which I thought was really good. Some ice cream cones there, so I love ice cream, but it was a, it was a beautiful day, and you know something? It's me in a hot summer day, and oh, oh. <laughs> All right, well, uh... I don't think I was that late. Well, luckily, I had somewhere to clean my hand, hand off, anyhow. And I need some butter there, and... Uh, yeah. All right, now, at this point, we're starting. You got some ice cubes, and... Yes, yeah, I see. I, I think what Bill is trying to say here is that the sun melts stuff. So now, Bill, apparently, was going to teach me some highly secret scientific principles, which is... Uh, which is how you can make a refrigerator... 
Uh, Whoa! <laughs> out in the woods. Okay, so he puts all the stuff that he wants to keep cool inside and then clean off the table. Oh my gosh. And uh, now that is uh, like a potato bag, burlap bag. Uh, oh, oh. Could have been worse. I could have been standing over there. And then you thread the rope up through here. And uh, now this is, uh, this is real interesting because what you're going to do is you're going to cover up all that stuff. Put the thing right over top of it, and that keeps it. And I, I figure, okay, that's the shade. You're gonna keep it in the shade, but no, no, you hang it up in a, in a tree so that the uh, the animals, I guess, can't get it and what have you. And now to keep it cool, you need uh, some sort of a. Well, luckily he had a he had a pipe plate in his pants there, and then he just. Ow! He's using one of my. How did that? Oh well. He's using that as a kind of a wick thing, and then he puts water in the plate. I think it's called capillary action. Uh, takes the water down. Down through the well, no, no, no that, that's gravity action. Anyway, that keeps it cool. The water evaporates or something. I don't know how it works, but apparently it works real well. Well, I guess not all that well. And here's another thing. This is a bag that's got all holes in a mesh bag. You should have got his fingers in there. We're gonna try and put some of the pop, the, the soda, in. Oh, oh, oh. oh. All right. Well, Bill's cooler already, so it's working. I puts all the cans of soda pop in there and take them down. And uh, the idea here is you uh, you tie a rope to it and you throw it out into the into the lake. You know, where it's cooler at the bottom and so on. And uh, actually, there, it should be. There's a couple of fridges down there, I think. Oh. oh. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna help them out. I mean, I understand this is not very scientific. This one, I, the water is cooler in the air. It's gonna keep the pop cool. So I tell Bill to hold onto the rope. I should have told him my fault. I should have told him to hold on to the end of the rope. Wow. Oh. He's scientific, he's not smart. So now we go back and we wait for the pop to cool. And we wait there five, six, I, it was probably around seven seconds, I guess. And then we decided, we, you know, we worked up a pretty powerful thirst. So uh, Bill hauls it in and uh, holler in there, Bill. Ho, ho, heave, ho, ho, heave. Boy, oh boy, that's a scary sight. Anyway, up she comes and uh, we each get out a can of pop. Of course, she's been uh, shaking up pretty good there, so uh, I forgot that Bill's getting a big laugh out of me here because I covered myself with a stick. Oh, that's funny, isn't it, Bill? What? Yours okay? <laughs> now here's something for young minds from something with a small mind. So welcome to Hanging with Harold, a brand new feature on the Red Green Show, which I'm sure is going to be of interest to anyone under the age of 80. <laughs> Okay, nobody tells you how to be a teenager, but everybody tells you how not to be one, right? Like, uh, don't leave your room a mess. Don't leave that fridge door open all night. Don't go stealing a car and go joyriding. <laughs> That's why kids join gangs, so they know how to behave. That and, you know, to protect them from other gangs, of course. Well, okay, well, if there's gonna be gangs, why can't there be, like, good gangs? <laughs> how about taking your switchblade, applying it to the end of a stick, pick up litter? Huh? <laughs> Instead of drive-by shootings, we could have, like, drive-by science classes. Did you know the peregrine falcon flies up to 170 miles per hour? <laughs> Imagine the United Way gang versus the UNICEF Way gang in, like, in a, in a fundraiser, huh? That'd be pretty neat. Or instead of street fights, we could have, like, street theater, right? Because remember the gang in, in the West Side Story? They, they all sang and danced, didn't they? And you're... Yeah. Huh? Ooh. Better wrap it up there, Harold. There's a gang forming out here. Oh, excellent. <laughs> well, I don't think you'll say that when you see what they did to your bike. <laughs> excellent. Sorry, Harold. I couldn't stop them, though. They were big girls. <laughs> you know, they say that uh, the young people are the future of this country. Well, I, I saw some young people today hanging out at Murray's store. And from what I can tell, the future is going to be bald on the sides with a long piece of hair on the top, spit, swear, smoke, and wear pants that are five sizes too big for it. <laughs> I said to them, boy, if you people are the future, I'm glad I'll be dying soon. And uh, they seem pleased with that themselves. <laughs> ah. Is that an extra club there, Bob? Oh, hi, Red. No, I was... Uh conducting an air density test for the Department of Natural Resources. <laughs> uh, you see how that, uh, how that drifted and then caught a thermal? It's very important in environmental data stuff. <laughs> I can just do the same test with the ball. Oh, sorry. 
Hold on, Bob, Bob. Bob, 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 Bob. Here, come here, come here. The problem is you, you can't read the, the, the wind speed thermal stuff and hit the ball at the same time. So, so I'll, I'll do the easy part. Oh, all right. <laughs> oh, uh, a red, uh, I try a, there's a, there's a sand trap on the left side, so try and, try and stay on the right side. Yeah, all right. Hmm, that's, that's right on the green, Red. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good, too. All right. <laughs> Listen, would you, let me take that, would you like to finish my round for me? Well, did you, did you get the, the wind information needed from the ball there? Hmm? Oh, yeah, well, don't worry about that. We've got 35 more holes to play. You know, Bob, I wanted to ask you, uh, do you know anything about an old mine uh, over on the east side of the lodge maybe a long time ago? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they closed that mine about 50 years ago. It was an old coal mine. Oh. They never produced enough coal to pay for itself, so, of course, they, they sold it to the government. <laughs> Everybody and his brother had a suggestion about uh, what to do with the old mine shaft. Make it into a garbage dump. <laughs> store nuclear missiles. <laughs> Make an underground skyscraper. <laughs> uh, Stinky Peterson here uh, wants to put an outhouse over it that you won't have to move for a thousand years. <laughs> Uncle Red, did you happen to read my suggestion? No, no, I haven't yet, Harold, but why, we got one. We got a funny one. This guy. <laughs> what an idiot. This guy. <laughs> this guy says, this guy gets, oh, this, this guy says, why don't you use the, <laughs> use the mine shaft as a, as a time capsule? <laughs> oh, man. oh, sorry, Harold. Sorry. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> Old man Cedric now, he said what he would like to do is he'd like to, to mine gasoline. How, how, how would that work? Well, it wouldn't, Harold, basically. Uh, but it just goes to show what we already knew, which is old man Cedric doesn't know his gas from a hole in the ground. <laughs> oh, that's Uncle Red. It's meeting time. Oh, meeting yeah, time. Right. OK, Harold, you go ahead. I'll, I'll be right down. OK. All right. Well, uh, that's about our show for this time, so if my wife is watching, I'll be coming straight home after the meeting, and uh, I think I found an ideal retirement home for your parents, as long as they don't mind the smell of coal. <laughs> and for the rest of you, on behalf of myself and Harold and the whole gang up here at Possum Lodge, uh, thanks for watching, and keep your stick on the ice.